Hi. Hey, Shani. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Good. Sorry we're running late today. I have to That's come all the way across campus. And my students <laughs> always come in late anyway. It sounds like a rough life. It is. Hey, everybody can see you now. And a little bit later in the chat, I'll turn around so you can see them as well, okay? Hi, everyone. How about from New York City? Hi. Shenny Jardine, everyone. Uh, Shenny uh, is a, a longtime friend of mine, and she is actually up very late for her tonight. It's about 12.40 a.m. there, right, Shenny? That's exactly it. Um, but I coaxed her to be here today to talk with us about this issue of identity on the Internet. That's our subject today. Because she's probably the best person I can think of on the whole planet to talk about this issue. I want to give you a little background on Shenny. Uh, Shenny actually started off her career um, as a tech reporter. And she has worked since that time to become uh, one of the contributors and one of the, the founding partners of a website that you're all looking at that you should have been reading about over the course of the semester, boingboing.net. Uh, Boing Boing is probably one of the most influential websites in the world. It actually is a money maker, right, Jenny? It is. It pays my bills. <laughs> and it actually focuses on so many interesting things, topics from human rights to the latest technology to uh, maker's art, making things with your kids and crafts, um, almost any kind of thing that you can think of that has some kind of creative edge to it, Boing Boing actually covers with its contributors and so on. And Shenny, in addition to that, has also become a television reporter for Boing Boing TV, and she also has worked for National Public uh, Radio as a radio reporter. So she, her pedigree is uh, pretty phenomenal here, so we're lucky to have her. And the other thing that I wanted to tell you about is that only last year, uh, Shenny got some disturbing news. She learned that she had breast cancer. And this has been uh, an obviously difficult thing for her and her family to deal with. Uh, but she has taken the remarkable step of sharing this process of going through uh, cancer treatment, how it's impacted her, her feelings about dealing with cancer in a very candid and honest way. And she's... Um, She's actually talked about this on the internet through Boing Boing and, and through, other, uh, uh, through other portals, I think, Shenny. But it's been an amazing look at your life and a very intimate part of your life. And I hope that you don't mind, but I'd like to start there of how it actually helps to form an online identity, uh, even though this is a very real and, and uh, difficult part of your identity. Um. So, yeah, I, I was diagnosed on December 1st, 2011, and um, I, this was, I, I was 41 years old. And in America, uh, women don't typically start getting annual mammograms until a little bit later in life. I think the, the government recommends that you start at age 50. So my doctor had never recommended it yet, and I wasn't really of the age group here in America where women start really feeling like they're at, at, at the age risk for breast cancer. But a couple friends of mine who are both uh, bloggers and internet, you know, internet personalities of a sort, uh, were both diagnosed with breast cancer uh, within a, a couple months of each other. One of them was a very close personal friend of mine, and I remember she was diagnosed just before Thanksgiving 2011. And it, it happened at a time when I was going through some personal upheaval in my own life, and I just remember thinking, if, if my friend, who is only 38, could become someone with cancer, and it seems so impossible, then maybe I should get checked out too. Uh, and, and so I went, uh, as soon as the American holiday was over, I went to a uh, private clinic. Here in America, uh, you, you always have to find clinics that your insurance covers, or you have to pay out of pocket. So I, I went through some steps to, to find a place that was open and that my insurance would cover. And I, uh, I went to, 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 get, to get scanned. And as I do with anything that's interesting and new in my life, I, I share it. Uh, any day's worth of blog posts at Boing Boing also consist of the things that I'm thinking about and talking about with friends and things that I personally care about. 
Um, everything that we do at Boing Boing, uh, everything that we write about or produce videos about are, are things that we're personally interested in one way or another. So um, when I was going to do this thing that was a little bit scary but interesting and new, uh, going to get a mammogram, I thought, you know, maybe I'll just share this on Twitter as the day unfolds. And maybe other women who, like me, are a little bit younger uh, than, than the recommended age to start this screening, maybe we can all learn something together. And maybe I'll be providing a kind of service to other women my age in sharing this. So I, I went, and um, the machine was an interesting machine. It was kind of a new uh, model from GE that was kind of new here in America. And, um, you're always the technique, I, I, even talking about going in for the screening, you're talking about the machine. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I thought I was a very healthy person, and I, you know, I run, I do yoga, I bike, I eat very healthy food, and uh, I, I don't smoke or do drugs or drink. And I thought, it, it's, certainly it's impossible for someone like me to get breast cancer only older women or women who, uh, you know, whatever, women who don't live a scrupulously healthy life uh, get breast cancer, and I was wrong. And about um, about eight hours after I, I first went in, uh, I learned that I had breast cancer. And I, I didn't tweet, you know, that moment. I, I went into shock, and it was... Um, it was the most horrible. It was the most horrible thing that ever happened to me, and I'm someone who survived a lot of things in my life. So uh, I, when when the when the doctor explained to me that what we were seeing on the mammogram and the ultrasound almost certainly meant that I had breast cancer, um, she then brought an assistant in to do a biopsy. They use these little things that are like, um, it's almost like a staple gun or a gun, and it shoots uh, a needle into your breast tissue and grabs a little piece of tissue out from the area where they suspect the, the mass to be. And, um, you know, even that was very frightening. They held me down on a table, and this loud thing, it was like they were shooting a gun into my breast and started bleeding, and I was crying, and it hurt. And everything happened very, very fast. And I, I called a friend to, to come and be with me. My boyfriend was, uh, he's, a, he's a television journalist, and he was on the other side of the country working on a documentary for Frontline about um, nuclear power in the age, uh, the post-Fukushima age. So he was inside the Indian Point nuclear plant north of New York City, and uh, we couldn't, couldn't receive calls. So I was there alone on the table crying, and um, you know, the person I loved the most in the world was inside a, a nuclear plant shooting a documentary for front line. So I, I found one of my closest girlfriends who was nearby in LA and called her and asked her to come be with me at the clinic and help me get through the next couple of hours. She did, and eventually I got to a place where I could call family members and explain to them what was happening. And I, I was, I, I got, you know, the shaking and the coldness and all of the, the intense shock that follows that kind of a moment um, died down over the next few hours. And, you know, I, I, I'd gone there, I think, at 9 in the morning, and, and by now it was 8 at night or something, and I, I realized that hours had passed since I tweeted to my you know, 70,000 Twitter followers or whatever it was uh, that, I, that I was going through this process. And so I thought, well, <coughs> this is a little weird. <laughs> like, what do you do? Do you share with the world that you've just been diagnosed with breast cancer? Or is it, is this too uh, grave and serious a moment to, to be publicly engaged? And I 
made the decision that felt natural to me, uh, and that was after I after I reached out to all of the closest people in my life. I was I was like in, in my car pulled over on the side of the road, getting ready to drive myself home. I just tweeted, um, "I have breast cancer," and I, I think the rest of the tweet went something like, "I'm in good hands." Um, there's a long road ahead of me, and I, I know that it leads to long life and good health. And that was, in fact, a lie. I didn't know that at all. What I knew was that I'd just been diagnosed with a disease that had a pretty good chance of killing me. And I had no idea what was ahead. But I hoped very much that the road ahead led to long life and good health. Shouldn't and I, in fact, still don't know that. But I still hope that very much, and I still live each day like that, um, keeping some things private and, and sharing some things that feel like they belong to the world as part of my work. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kevin. No, Shani, I was going to say, I, I think at that moment, um, your identity changed for these 70,000 people that follow you on Twitter and these millions of people that follow you on, follow you on Boing Boing and the rest of the internet that you went from this kind of superwoman to the, this person that is you know, so incredibly intelligent and knowledgeable and seemingly all powerful to, to someone that was very human. Um, tell me a, about why you decided to share that. Why not keep up the facade of, of being perfectly healthy and, and continuing to do what you've done? Because honestly, if you look at your body of work, People really can't tell that you had cancer. If they were just looking at your writing, if you had never mentioned it, the output is the same. Um, the, the nature of who I have been publicly for as long as I've known you, Kevin, is it's, it's not journalism in the classical sense in that I, I engage with the subjects that I cover, they, they become part of my life, or I engage um, personally somehow with the stories. It's it's not, you know, what, what a reporter at the New York Times necessarily does. It's not what an anchor at CNN does. But it's it's a particular brand of, um, you know, gonzo journalism that we at Boing Boing feel very comfortable with. It's something between a personal online diary and uh, journalism in the classic sense. Uh, so, when this experience happened, it just seemed like, for, for me, it would be dishonest to do anything but share that process. It, I, think, I think I said to a friend at the time that being diagnosed with breast cancer felt like being assigned to a beat that you really, really didn't want by an editor that you could not argue with. It still feels that way. Um, now that I've gone through a year and a half of treatment and um, have some distance and perspective from the initial shock and have some health back and more of my cognitive abilities back, I can now start doing other kinds of work and covering other kinds of things than this biological process happening inside my body. But it's still... It's the, it's the greatest and most important story of, of my life thus far. Uh, and it, it just seemed natural to, to want to talk my way through that. And in doing so, the, the, the wonderful part of that, um, that bargain to, to share what was very personal, is that I connected with some people who became very, very important to me. Uh, people who helped me through the extraordinarily painful and confusing process of navigating treatment. How do you make a decision about whether or not you're going to submit to eight weeks of daily radiation treatments? How do you make a decision about, you know, when your doctors tell you, you have a choice between a lumpectomy and a unilateral mastectomy and a bilateral mastectomy. And by the way, there are like eight different choices of reconstruction that we might pursue or no reconstruction at all. Each of these choices has profound, profound consequences. Um, the people that I connected with online 
as a result of me sharing parts of my experience, help me to navigate those choices in a way that minimized my suffering and confusion and left me feeling like I, I was better informed and better empowered and better supported than I, than I could have been without, without that connectivity. There's a, there's a vast resource of emotional and informational support available for cancer patients um, who are able to connect in that way. I was privileged to be able to access that. You, you were privileged, but also that dialogue went both ways, Shani. Um, it did. You, you were actually receiving information from the thousands, millions of people that care and, and were reading what you were writing. And, and you were communicating uh, some amazing work at that time period, someone that was going through a process firsthand, but that had the skills and abilities of an amazing writer and was able to communicate mm -hmm. it in an articulate way that I think has seldom been done in the past. And so, did you feel in some ways that you had a responsibility to the people out there that were reading, uh, as well as, as the information that you were getting back? Did you, did you feel that kind of connection with people that was missing for those, few, those first few moments when you were diagnosed, when you were in that, uh, that area, um, getting the tests mm -hmm. and being separated from everyone that you loved? Sure. And... Um... You know, it, 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 that response was was often overwhelming. There are um, there, there are so many emails, hundreds and hundreds of emails that I may never be able to respond to um, from people who who themselves had just been diagnosed or who had just lost a uh, husband or a wife, a mother or a child to cancer. There were. People who are asking me for advice or just sharing stories about their experience. Early on in, the ex in, in my experience with breast cancer, I felt like I had you know, almost like a spiritual obligation to respond to every single one of them and to try to connect with them with the resources or the answers or the, the virtual hug that, that they needed. And then as my treatment dragged on, um, part of what you go through when you're going through chemotherapy and surgeries and radiation, each of these things, and all of them cumulatively, um, they drain you of energy in the most profound way imaginable. There's a difference between being tired, dog tired, like the worst tired that you've ever been in your life. We multiply that by 100, and that's the fatigue that cancer patients experience when they're going through treatment. It's frightening. And sleep does not help it get any better. Nothing helps it get any better except maybe a year of being out of cancer treatment. It's, it's awful. And so what I learned was that I would have to very, very, very carefully ration my time, ration my attention, ration communication. And in fact, one woman uh, who's a breast surgeon based in LA who I met through Twitter, um, she was one of the ones who told me, like, she, she came over to my house one afternoon to bring me food. It was so weak that I couldn't, I couldn't prepare food for myself, let alone go shopping. And uh, she came over to deliver grocery bags full of food and flowers and just sit with me and check in and see how I was and answer the questions that my doctors weren't doing a great job of answering. And she said, you know, it was, it was really like a Twitter intervention. She said, Shani, you, you can't even cook for yourself or go to the bathroom without help. And you're, you're answering every single person who asks you for support or asks you for help or advice on Twitter. I'm telling you as your friend and as a surgeon who deals with breast cancer patients every day that you have to pull back. And I, I, I listened to her in a way that I wouldn't have with other family members or friends. And I think I've, I've learned something about, about how better to ration my time and attention and connectivity uh, since then. I have a lot more energy. I have a lot more... Um, your, your brain becomes damaged in cancer treatment. There's a, here we call it chemo brain in the States. The, the chemotherapy, the radiation, the surgery, each element of treatment, whether you have one or all three, 
um, changes the way your brain functions. So now that my brain is functioning more normally and a little bit more like it did before I started treatment, I, I still realize that I, I can't stress myself out the way I used to. I, I, I can't work for hours that are as long. I can't make the same kind of communication demands. So for someone who is an always on connected communication junkie, um, it's a diff difficult transition to make, but it's working out pretty well so far. No, and you've done an amazing job in, in both informing and, and responding to the people that have, uh, have reached out to you. But you spent your entire life walking that threshold between the online and the real world. And I wonder, how has the cancer changed that? Are you walking in, in more of one than the other now? Um, when I'm spending time with people that I care about, or spending time doing something that matters somewhere, you know, away from my workspace, I try to be present more often. I, I, I have a rule now that if I'm sitting and having a meal with someone, I'm not looking at my mobile device. I, I used to compulsively check email or, or tweet or Facebook or, or whatever all the time, or I Google things throughout a conversation when I couldn't remember them. I really try to avoid that and let screen time be screen time and let, and really what it means in the moment with a place, with an experience, or with a person. So uh, I think. You know, I still spend a lot of time on the internet. I still spend a lot of time engaged with my mobile device. I still spend a lot of time being connected with people virtually. But I'm more, I'm much more mindful of the value of being fully, fully present and focused um, with people I choose to be around in real life. I mean, all my life is real life too. I, I never really did like that phrase. It, it, the, the people that I connect with each day uh, online. You know, in, in, in the breast cancer community and beyond that, uh, other friends, other colleagues, that's as real as somebody sitting in the same room with me. And actually, here in New York, uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to meet with a woman, beautiful woman. Her name is uh, Lisa Adams. It's Adams Lisa, I think, is her handle on Twitter. Lisa is around my age. Um, I think she's like 41 or something. And she's a mother of three in Connecticut. Few hours north of, of where I am in New York City tonight. And Lisa reached out to me early on in my treatment and became like a big sister. She sent me things in the mail to help me through my experience. Like she sent me this box of um, soft caps to wear during chemo and my hair fell out. She sent me different kinds of treats that would help me deal with different symptoms that I had, or she sent me a binder and taught me how to organize my medical papers. She was so, she was available by text, by phone, by email, anytime I was freaking out or was having trouble making a decision about the next phase of my treatment or just, you know, you go through hell. And she, she became a really intimate friend. We, we hadn't met ever until, uh, just a few months ago, and Lisa was recently diagnosed with a recurrence of her cancer. She'd been in remission for six years, and um, Lisa now has a very advanced metastatic disease, and um, the, the survival odds are very different for someone like Lisa than they are for me. She's taking chemo every day, in the hopes of just staving off the progression of her disease, but she is now preparing for death. And she's preparing her family for death. And the experience of her mentorship extends even to that most sacred and most personal transition imaginable. And, and she is She's, she's the most amazing writer. Even as she goes through this, this horrible realization um, that this phase of her life is, is beginning, she blogs every day, she tweets every day. When, when people send her stupid 
stuff like if you drink kale juice, your cancer will go away. If you pray or think positive thoughts, uh, your disease won't metastasize. She responds to that kind of ignorance, um, almost like a hobby or a game, uh, but always in a compassionate and informative way and never saying, God, that's so stupid. Thanks a lot. I really needed to hear that. Um, she's amazing. You should all follow her, whether or not you have cancer or care about cancer or whatever. She's, just a, she's an amazing person. Not a, not a journalist. I mean, she is a journalist now. Shani, that, that brings up a really important point, though, is that with the Internet, um, you know, you certainly are and have been an accomplished writer, but someone that has not, does this give them in these, uh, in these final months, weeks, days for them um, – a lasting legacy, a, a chance to, to imprint their lives on others and, and to share things that might have been really spent alone in those final days. It's funny that you say that. Just as we, um, we, we connected a few weeks ago here in New York, uh, I came up with my boyfriend to, to visit her. And we, we were alone for a few minutes in Grand Central Station when Lisa was waiting for her train to go home. And I forget how we started talking about it, but like I was telling her how much I appreciated her work and, and the, the really powerful, forceful nature of her work right now. And she, she said, she, she, she and I were both talking about how there's this sense that the internet is so temporary and the internet is so fleeting. But then when you go through an experience like what, what she is going through and, and what I am going through, you realize that life is very fleeting. And that oddly, now the internet offers a kind of permanence, a kind of uh, an ethereal but permanent repository of our lives. When she is gone, her blog will remain as, as, as a permanent kind of repository of, of these very intimate and very powerful thoughts, these thoughts that are so intimate that she might not even be able to share them verbally with her husband or with her children. But she's written blog posts to her children, you know, to her children who are like five, eight years old, that she, that she hopes they'll read when they're older. Um, so yeah, we stood there and we talked about the idea of legacy. And I, my, one of my favorite movies is this movie called Alphaville by Jean-Luc Godard. I'm going to say uh, French New Wave filmmaker. And, and Alphaville is a very difficult film to watch because it's really slow, like all Godard movies. But it's about this uh, evil IBM mainframe computer. This, this film is like from, I forget, 1964. And it's about an evil IBM mainframe computer that uh, takes over the city of Alphaville and forbids the citizens of Alphaville from feeling love or any emotions. And this movie starts out with a quote, and I, I recited it to, uh, to Lisa as we were standing there in the station. And it, it's, in French, it's like, um, sometimes reality is so complex that it cannot be captured in oral transmission in words. But legend captures it and embodies it and allows it to, to spread infinitely throughout the world. And, and that is what we do. We, we create a kind of legend in, in sharing our lives online. Shani, that's really beautiful. And uh, we also know, though, it's, uh, could you just uh, touch the mouse? It is 1.15 a.m. there now. And I want to take a, a few questions from our students before we let you go to bed, if that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Just shout them out really loud. The microphone isn't working. Uh, was there a particular reason why you chose to live tweet your mammogram? Like, because, like, even how many followers you have, is there a particular reason? Like, was there a particular message you wanted to send out to your followers? Yeah, um, well, first, I, I really, again, I didn't think that I had cancer. I just thought it was like going to, going to give blood for the first time or... I don't know, it was just some medical thing. I never thought it would have any dire consequences because I thought I was magically protected from having cancer. Um, but the fact that these two friends of mine had just been diagnosed uh, within you know, weeks or months of each other, um, they were both kind of well-known internet personalities within our circle of peers. And it, it just seemed like 
Like if, if they were diagnosed, there would probably be others who are at risk. And maybe this was a way of um, spreading a kind of awareness of, of, of what those screening tools were. I, I know more than I did then about how effective or not effective mammograms are as a screening tool. And that's a whole other conversation. But the, the, the naive idea that I had that morning was um, this would be a way to spread a positive public health message to other women who are part of internet culture. And uh, we should all kind of get over the fear of, um, of, of, of this process together. Great. Uh, next question. You're so positive. So that's why many people support you. But however, uh, but um, do you find any negative comments from the viewers? And how do you feel about it? So what kinds of comments? Do you make? And how do you uh, uh, see this comment? I couldn't understand all of it because of the sound, uh, but something about comments. The question, Shenny, was that you seem to be so positive during all this process, and were there any negative comments? And if so, how did you respond to them? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I didn't, I wasn't positive in real life. <laughs> I was really miserable and sad much of that time. Um, but, it, but like the internet was the safe place. Real life didn't feel safe at all. Uh, and what was happening inside my body didn't feel safe at all. Um, so, so yeah, the internet felt like a place where I was suddenly receiving a lot of really beautiful support and information and interaction. There was also some awful interaction, just like any day on the internet. The absolute worst, bullying, most abusive, sexist, disgusting, interaction that you can imagine, uh, some of that happened in, in response to what I shared around cancer, too. I, I think probably all of the women in the class are, are familiar with um, a, a particular kind of, of bullying and ugly behavior that tends to be directed at, at women online, and uh, that, that really got ramped up to uh, a, a really extreme and, and disgusting uh, level. But, it was like there, there, there was some of that, and you just, I don't know, I just, I, I tuned it up because the positive rewards of sharing were so much more powerful. But there were some times that, that yeah, that was really upsetting. Okay, next question. Uh, do you think the use of Twitter really helped you to, like, go through this process? And how differently do you think you would have gone through this if it weren't for, like, interacting with the internet? Twitter in particular really did help me. Um, it was such a, the, the beautiful thing about Twitter is that, that there's, it's simple uh, and the returns are so immediate and can be so overwhelming. Like that, that, first, that first tweet that I shared after the diagnosis, you know, announcing my diagnosis, I, I wish that I had captured what the response was. There must have been a thousand tweets from people I know and people I don't know and people whose names I'll never even remember basically saying, you know, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I wish you the best. We're here and we're thinking about you. Um, had, had I not had that particular tool available, I think because of my character and because of how I interact with the world and how social I am, I probably would have sought out that love and support and information and, and kinship in some other way. But I, I feel very, very fortunate that that particular tool existed at just the right time for me. And and perhaps, you know, perhaps all of you, if 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 one of you goes through uh, a similarly traumatic life experience, um, maybe Twitter won't be the thing that helps you. Maybe there will be some other social network. Uh, maybe perhaps a social a social connecting medium that doesn't even exist today that will help you connect with with like souls. One final question. Uh, this incident changed your feelings towards interactions in the social media. I mean, before they may just feels like uh, pictures and names, but now you think that 
you are really talking with real persons. Yeah, I think I already knew that, but this really brought it home. I think it changed. For me, there was a kind of frivolity and, and irreverence and playfulness to my interaction with the internet before this event. And after this event in my life, um, there's a kind of gravitas that accompanies everything I do online. Uh, and I, I think in, in realizing that some of the little avatars that I see on my screen every day, you know, some of those familiar avatars that brighten up my screen, some of them are people with cancer, and some of those people with cancer have died, and they're not on my screen anymore. And some of the ones who are there that I look, I look for every day, um, the odds are that they will die soon because of the progression of their disease. So it, it's like it was already clear to me that the little avatars in my Twitter feed are human beings, but you know, grieving over the loss of someone who you may have never, maybe you never even exchanged an email with, but they were part of the like the little breast cancer group on Twitter. Um, it's something that's, that's very, very real, and it's kind of hard to come to terms with. How emotionally involved do you get with something that's just, you know, it's an avatar in your Twitter feed? No, it's a, it's a human being. It's someone who's a lot like you. Um, but by the way, before, before we say goodbye, I want to make sure that you guys know about uh, BCSM. So hashtag BCSM stands for Breast Cancer Social Media. And it's, uh, to call it a group is kind of a funny word, but it's just basically a whole bunch of uh, men and women who connect around breast cancer. They are patients, and men get breast cancer too. Uh, they are doctors, um, surgeons, they're sometimes family members of people with breast cancer. And every Monday night here in the States, I think it's at... at um, is it 9 o'clock? Anyway, it's, it's Monday night uh, in the United States. There's an hour-long chat that's led by a couple of women every week, and they always pick a topic. So it might be end-of-life care or um, might be palliative care, in other words, drugs that ease pain. It might be, for instance, um, the results of an important oncology conference that may have just happened where they have uh, a, a surgeon who went to the conference or an oncologist who went to the conference who has new research to share with people before it's in the news. Uh, this might be a really interesting um, online phenomenon for you to look at. They, the women who run this group all have breast cancer or, uh, or they're care providers. And that group ended up being really, really important for me. And it, it was amazing because I'd never seen a community that was that cohesive that tightly knit and that cordial. A lot of times online discussions devolve into um, rudeness and other forms of you know, antisocial behavior. There's something about people who all have a, a disease that wants to kill you. You know, when, when people that have that kind of a thing in common come together online, it's, it's ironic that uh, it's so much kindness and beauty ends up coming out of that. Shannon, listening to you, it's just, it's, it's pretty amazing because we look at the internet in a certain way and then we look at our world and it's so big, but as you begin to find things that connect you, you know, things as, as wonderful as, as a shared interest or things as terrible as, as breast cancer, that world becomes so much smaller and we become so much more connected in, in ways that are meaningful. And I'm yeah. so, so grateful that you've been able to take the time to share all this with us. Um, you know, usually when my class is listening to me talk, uh, they're usually asleep or in front of their computer hiding, probably tweeting or doing something else. They've been spellbound while you've talked this whole time. Because what you're saying oh, that's is, nice. is as meaningful as it is, it's also, it sounds like poetry coming out on this end. And so we'd like to make sure that everyone can, can thank you properly. And I'd like to use the same medium, uh, which you have used so often, 
uh, possibly for them to tweet back to you and say thank you for the time that you've given us. Uh, what uh, tweet account should we use? You want to give them uh, an address? Oh, my, my Twitter account is Shenny, X-E-N-I. Shenny, X-E-N-I. Yeah. That's it? That's yep, that's it. Account. And please, please uh, uh, take a look at the Boing Boing Twitter account, too. It's just B-O-I-N-G, B-O-I-N-G. It's a lot of fun. They, uh, they've been reading that throughout the course of the semester, or at least they're supposed to. And now they're going, to be, they're going to be following you, not just as someone that's contributing on there, but someone that they, they know a little bit better. I really thank uh, the generosity of your time, spending so much uh, time and effort to talk with us, being up this late. I know that you're traveling to Guatemala uh, to cover the trial of General Rios Montz um, concerning civil rights abuses in the 80s. You're just still going strong and doing amazing work. We'll be it's, the, it's, the, it's the first trip that I've been able to do like that since my diagnosis. It's, it's a big, um, I, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to return to that. I'm very, very happy and grateful to be able to do that. And you guys, you have a, you have a really special teacher in Kevin Seitz. He's a very, very special guy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stay up until 2 a.m. for just anybody. Okay. <laughs> They're not sure they believe you, but uh, anyway, that'll be, that'll be on the pop quiz. Who's hey, look at me. I need all the beauty rest I can get. You look, you look great, and, and we're all wishing you the best of health, and, and we're, we're out there rooting for you. Thank you, Jenny. All right. All right.